Fantasy 15 is not technically the most recent Final Fantasy game. That would be Remake, uh, 7 Remake Part 1, which I will need to do a review on, a video review on at some point, even though I've beaten it a while back and done a written review of it. But it, 15 is the most recent mainline title in the series. When 6 got re announced last, or when 16, I should say, got announced last year, I decided then was a good time to focus my attention on finally beating 15, and now I am giving my thoughts in video form as we approach the release of 16. Final Fantasy 15 opens with a road trip, and then proceeds to go right to hell. For the characters, not for the story, or sort of for the story, but not for the player. How about that? Prince Noctis of the Kingdom of Lucis is going on a road trip with his friends and bodyguards on the way to his wedding. His bodyguards being burly swordsman Gladiolus, wise-cracking gunslinger Prompto, and studious lancer and glasses boy Ignis. The wedding being with Luna Freya, oracle of the Kingdom of Tenebrae, and who Noctis knew as a kid, but who they haven't seen for years since. However, first their car breaks down, then, while they're waiting for repairs, the neighboring empire of Nephilheim invades Lucis during a peace treaty signing, killing Noctis' father. This forces Noctis and company to have to change their plans. Now they have to go forth to collect the power of the previous kings of Lucis to their weapons and make bonds with various gods or summons, basically, before reclaiming the throne. And through all of this, they're contending with imperial forces and the machinations of a mysterious imperial court advisor, Arden Azuna, whose actions initially both help and hinder the actions of our heroes. Where the game is at its best is through the interplay of your party members and the act of exploring the world. We'll cover the last one first. Final Fantasy XV, unlike most of XIII, sticks the majority of the game in a fairly wide open, expansive world. It's not as expansive in scope as the events of the 32 bit Final Fantasy games, that's 7, 8, and 9, but it's as big as you can get without splitting the game in between an abstracted overworld and specific points of lights in the game world. Sort of like what they did with 12. The player is able to freely explore the environment with the main limitations being the party's level in comparison with monsters in the environment and some areas being plot gated early on. This all works well with the road trip nature of Final Fantasy XV story. You're driving your vehicle, the regalia, either somewhat directly or letting Ignis drive while you enjoy the scenery through these wide open spaces and getting to visually enjoy them, listening to classic music from the final throughout the Final Fantasy series on your car stereo, which you get to buy more soundtracks over the course of the game. We're pulling off the side of the road to travel across country on foot to various quest objectives or places you want to explore. Um, could be a photo point by the side of the road that uh, Prompto has called the, the party's attention, or it's a bounty that you're hunting, or a major story quest objective. And to fit with all of this more modern-inspired setting, the small villages that you'd normally find in previous games are replaced with effectively truck stops and roadside hotels. Small settlements with a gas station, hotel, and diner, with a couple of larger settlements scattered throughout the game world. As you travel and adventure, rather than gaining experience and leveling spontaneously while adventuring, as you would with most other JRPGs, or RPGs of this type in general, even like, honestly, Western RPGs. Instead, you have to find a safe rest point to go to, taking a cue from the structure that's advised in some of the older tabletop RPGs for when you would, as the Game Master, hand out experience points. You gain XP, yes, by slaying monsters completing quests, but you don't actually get the chance to level up until you rest at a campsite or inn. Now, resting at an inn costs you money, but because it's a more comfortable rest, you get a multiplier for your XP gain. Greater multipliers for um, more comfortable places to stay. A nice little... Um, or roadside, like basically a Motel 6 might get you a 1.5 multiplier, a re um, 
basically available to rent um, motor home or um, that sort of thing, a caravan, if you're in the if you're in Europe or the EU uh, or Britain, that might get you a 1.25 and a really posh five star hotel. You might get like a three times multiplier, but you'll pay out the nose for it. But at the other hand, if you rest at a campsite, while you don't get a multiplayer, Ignis can prepare a meal using ingredients that you've either purchased or picked up for gather points in the environment or by fishing or slaying monsters to make a meal that will provide stat bonuses that will persist basically until the next time you rest. Now you can buy also buy meals from restaurants in town and those will also provide buffs, but they will have a smaller selection. That said, the first time you buy a meal from any restaurant, Ignis will learn that recipe just by trying it and then in turn can recreate it at any campsite provided you have the ingredients. Additionally, you can buy cookbooks from shops and if you just collect all the right ingredients for a recipe, there's a chance that Ignis will just come up with it spontaneously. All of this works well with the world building because it gives the environment a strong sense of the old fantasy trope, um, again, which shows up in Final Fantasy series and the a lot of the older games or Dragon Quest or that sort of thing where monsters have started to become more aggressive and dangerous. But because it's implied in the framework of a modern society with towns and settlements that were built as stopovers when it was safer and the roads were much more traveled, uh, but as things more have become more dangerous, you can also see that in turn things have become much more abandoned outside of the frequently traveled way places which are protected more heavily by basically rangers. And as you explore the world, you're getting plenty of banter from your party members. The four boys have really strong chemistry as well as well-realized personality types. Admittedly, these are variances from the pretty standard archetypes that if you've watched any real amount of anime or manga, stuff like around high school host club, you'll probably recognize most of them. Um, Keat, Wild, Cool, and Prince for Prompto, Gladio, Ignis, and Noctis respectively. While the lack of female party members did have the game justifiably face some controversy on release, it also does give a sense that the part of the character design decisions was made to continue to make the game more attractive to female audiences by having a bunch of hot, pretty boys to look at, and also probably to fuel doujinshi. It's not for nothing that the first point where you have control of the camera as they're pushing the players are or player characters rather are pushing the car you basically have the camera paying loving attention to gladio's black leather pants clad ass that said the female characters that we get are underutilized luna freya is the woman noctis is due to marry but she has very little narrative agency sid's daughter is the first character we encounter but she's played for fan service the one who spends any amount of time in the party is Ariana Highwind, a dragoon, but she's in the party for basically about a dungeon or so and doesn't get much development. Now, maybe while this might have been a conscious decision to minimize the number of characters who could potentially be in heterosexual relationships with the protagonist, it's still not great. These Some of these characters do get fleshed out in um, relevant episodes for the uh, DLC that did not come out and was later adapted into a novel, which I will be covering later. The point that doesn't matter too much in this case, because we're talking about the game that we sh that was shipped and that you can buy and play. Now, Final Fantasy 15 does have some flaws also with the magic system. The traditional Final Fantasy magic structure is not here with the focus instead specifically shifting to elemental magic. You gather elemental magic energy at various gather points and combine it with reagents, usually monster parts or consumable items, to have different magical effects, putting variations on your classic fire, fira, faraga hierarchy of spells. Where things fall down, though, is when it comes to healing. You can apply modifiers to spells so that they heal the caster through using particular reagents, mainly by tossing healing items like potions and spells. And, but you don't get the old status effect healing standbys like Asuna 
or any of the other similar status effect hearing spells. Theoretically, you, they could have done this where if you put a status effect removing item on a spell, uh, like an antidote, then your party members would all get the same status effect removing effect if they're caught in the blast, allowing you to do a mass cure of poison or what have you, like you would have been able to do if you did a mass heal or heal all in, say, Final Fantasy 4, 5, 6, or 7. That sort of thing. Using this bell as a sort of force multiplier, a healing force multiplier, but no such luck here. Instead, your resource balance for healing is based strictly on healing items you have with you, and in turn, how much money you have to spend to stock up on them. I still found myself at the end of the game with plenty of healing items to spare, but I also suspect I spent much more money stocking up on those items than I did picking them up in the game world. The overall narrative of Final Fantasy V is also darker than the other games have beaten in this uh, series, with the victory being more Pyrrhic than the other games in the series. The final act is definitely a clear shout out to the World of Ruin from Final Fantasy VI, but the ultimate outcome, again, it's, it's darker. It's the world is saved, but at a significant personal cost for the protagonists. Now, this isn't a unique ending for anime or anime-related media. Indeed, this type of ending is what drew me to anime when I was in middle school or high school, that there wasn't necessarily the kind of happily ever after that you would necessarily get with more Western media. Our protagonists would triumph, but they didn't necessarily win as get out unscathed. But still, it is less of a clear-cut happy ending than some of the other games in the Final Fantasy series themselves that I've played. And, oh, the combat. Combat is more action-based, with an option to dev a sort of turn-based inspired mode, but it's basically on all a less polished version of the combat system that we got in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. It didn't take me long, that long to get a, the hang of it, and once I l learned the ropes, I generally did all right, but I'm having played Final Fantasy VII Remake um, before, I beat Final Fantasy V, or 15, rather. I would definitely say I liked how the combat played out, the iteration of this structure that was used in the Final Fantasy VII Remake more. Ultimately, I really did enjoy this game. Um, I enjoyed the chemistry that the boys have together. I like was able to eventually get the hang of the combat system, and I really ultimately ended up enjoying that. And, I mean, I... Like it, playing it long enough to go through basically all the side quests, except for fighting Gadget Man Toys, and played all the DLC episodes. I've even picked up the novel that adapts the episodes that were meant to be the game's conclusion. Pros review of that's already up, but for those who prefer a more video take on the topic, I will have a video review of that later. Or at least audio tour, if, you were just li if you're just listening to the videos. But I will have... the. Er, review that here on the channel in the not-too-distant future. But in the meantime, I do recommend picking up the game. The Royal Edition, which adds a bit to the ep to the final act of the game and also includes all the episodes of the DLC, uh, goes on sale on a regular basis and also frequently ends up on Game Pass and PlayStation Plus. So there's that option there as well. I recommend picking, I definitely recommend picking it up. There will be links, of course, in the doobly-doo to where you can do so. And some of those will be affiliate links and will be marked accordingly. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, cost me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.